All right. Hello, everybody. Hello, Virginia. It is four o'clock on Monday and time we come together to remember we're going to get through this and we're going to get through this together. We're going to start with good news, really good news. And that is what we are seeing in our economy. Today, we have more good economic news to share as we continue a string of positive announcements that show that our economy is open, healthy, moving in the right direction, and at a faster pace than most. So last month, so quick recap, Site Selection Magazine, an industry publication, and validated our hard work ranking Kentucky at the very top of the South Central region and third nationally last year in 2020 for projects per capita. That was one piece of good news that said we did better than just about anybody else in 2020 in terms of announcements and our wages for those jobs were the second highest I think we've ever had. So last week, we learned that Fitch's Ratings, that's one of the big three credit rating agencies, had upgraded its views on Kentucky's financial outlook based on our, quote, solid economic recovery. It boosted our rating because of our responsible fiscal management, which includes in this administration two, not just balanced budgets, but surpluses, and the state's largest ever rainy day fund balance, despite the pressures posed by this pandemic. It also talked about Kentucky's employment recovery, which through March is running slightly ahead of the national pace. More on that in a moment. This news uh, uh, followed that, and that was that today, John Hicks officially released our general fund and road fund receipts. And as previewed last week, sales and use tax receipts reached an all-time monthly high of $486.5 million. Year-to-date collections have grown 9.5%. This means that there was more sales tax, meaning more spending, this April than any April in our history. So whatever people want to say about the economy being open, it's more open than any other April in our history, as shown by what people are actually doing by their economic activity. Also, it means that more cars uh, were sold uh, based on usage tax. Uh, in April than in any April in our history. So this money is gonna be added to the current fiscal year general fund, which is estimated to have more than a $586 million surplus. And the first time that I can remember in a while, a surplus in the road fund as well. We're gonna end up with more than a billion dollars in the bank in our rainy day fund. We've never had that much, never even close in terms of actual dollars, dollars or percentage of the budget. More than that, this last, Month general fund receipts increased 59.1%. Year to date up 10.8%. Road fund receipts uh, this last month up 59.9%. Year to date up 5.5%. Okay, so other indications and, and showings that our economy is humming. Uh, this one actually impacted us um, in, in a different way. Today, the US Department of Treasury announced that Kentucky is set to receive $2.183 billion from the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 for the Coronavirus State Fiscal Recovery Fund. This allotment is a little bit smaller than what we anticipated because part of the equation in setting it was the state's economic performance, meaning how hard had we been hit versus how much had we recovered. Our Overall number, 2.183 is below what we thought we'd get, 2.4, uh, because our fourth quarter of last year, uh, we recovered more than most states around us. In fact, I think we were in the uh, top seven in the way their calculations worked and thus moved those numbers. In other words, Kentucky has recovered stronger than the federal government anticipated, faster than most, and it impacted a little bit on the dollars that will be available to us. Now, this isn't going to impact whatsoever uh, what the General Assembly has already appropriated. They only did about half of that, uh, but these are dollars. Now, we still have over a billion dollars that we can put to work making sure our economy continues to grow, continues to stay hot. And as we like to say, you know, the, the buckle up, we're going um, uh, really good uh, places. Gene Sperling, who is coordinating and the implementation of the American Rescue Plan for the White House, called me today and spoke to me ahead of the announcement. 
Again, he said the change is the latest sign of a healthy and strengthening Kentucky economy that is outperforming many other states. All right, new jobs today. Again, following all of these positive indicators, there's actually the announcements of where we are seeing new jobs. I'd like to highlight a very special announcement in the uh, West Kentucky community of Madisonville as we continue to build back our economy stronger than ever in the Commonwealth. Alstrom Monksjaw plans to expand its presence in Kentucky with a $70 million investment to build a second facility in Hopkins County that'll create 51 jobs with an hourly wage of $30, including benefits. The glass fiber tissue producer currently employs more than 130 people in Madisonville at a facility that has been an important part of the local business community since 1974. As a Finnish-owned company, Alstrom's growth adds to Kentucky's strong core of internationally owned manufacturers, which employ about 111,000 Kentuckians. The company's new facility will provide capacity for production of glass fiber tissue used for luxury vinyl tiles and vinyl sheet materials. The company's filtration materials are used for automotive and industrial applications and deliveries from the new operation are expected to begin mid-2023. Alstrom is a global company employing about 78,000 people around the world at 54 facilities. We are fortunate the company has made its home in Kentucky. We are so excited about this expansion. As always, I tell them don't stop there. We have uh, many more opportunities here in Kentucky. We look forward to seeing you grow. Congratulations to Madisonville and Hopkins County. But that's not all. We continue to see announcements of more and more investment in existing Kentucky facilities. So today, Apple, you've probably heard of that company. They're one of the world's biggest and best technology companies, announced that it's investing an extra $45 million to boost research and development at the Corning Inc.'s Glass Manufacturing and Innovation Center in Harrodsburg. This isn't the first investment Apple has made at the plant, which produces high-tech break and scratch resistance glass for the company's flagship iPhone mobile devices and other products. Back in 2017, Apple launched a $5 billion advanced manufacturing fund to boost innovation in materials and production methods. The same year, Apple awarded $200 million from the fund to the Corning plant in Harrodsburg. They added another $250 million to the effort in 2019. So at today's announcement, Apple's invested over $300 million in that Harrodsburg facility. That's really exciting. A company like this seeing us as a part of their future. Officials with Apple said the latest investment will fund continuing research and development at the Harrodsburg site, which will also su help support the 400 well-paying jobs there. Great news for the people of Harrodsburg, Mercer County, and the entire Commonwealth. Uh, we just see through these announcements and through everything else uh, from what we see on the ground to receipts every month to Fitches uh, to to the, the, the jobs numbers, we're seeing Kentucky with a hot economy, I believe, recovering faster than most. And it's because of the way we've managed this virus. I think this entire country is going to see great economic growth. But I think those that are going to do it the best and the most sustainably are going to be ones that have made wise decisions to date and continue to make wise decisions in the very short time um, as we're finishing dealing with this virus. All right, let's look at um, our week completed with our stair stepper chart on where we were with COVID this last week. And good news, we were down from the week before. But as you look at the very end of that chart, what you see is that plateau going up a little, going down a little, going up a little, going down a little. And let's not sneeze at the fact that it's still about the levels of our summer surge, meaning we are not out of the woods, but we are in such a better place than in the fall, late fall and early winter. Uh, even better news, our COVID-19 test positivity is down. Uh, meaning that, that we have indeed plateaued there as well. Uh, if we can bring up that stair stepper chart, that's the blue one. Okay, it looks like this. Um, as you can see at the very end, uh, we are down just a little bit, but again, um, up a little, down a little, up a little, down a little. There was a period of time 
where we thought that uh, we were starting to see an increase there. Uh, what about um, patients in the ICU? Do we have that one today? There we go. As you can see, plateaued. That's our uh, inpatient census. Let's show the ICU. Same thing. Let's show Kentuckians on a ventilator. Same thing. Um, and, and hospital capacity, if we have it, is exactly what we've seen the last several weeks. We still have people that, that need and are getting help from our medical facilities for COVID, but we do have plenty of hospital capacity right now, which is a blessing. At the end of this thing, we'll be one of the few states that never um, was overrun uh, in our facilities in, in any part of Kentucky, and we're able to help everyone that could get to one of those facilities. All right, we, let's look at um, uh, vaccinations. Uh, first, let's look at uh, our overall numbers, if we have that. Here's our table. Um, we're now showing uh, day over uh, day increases. Uh, so what you could see is, is about um, 8,500 uh, vaccinations between yesterday and today, or the last report uh, and today's. Still at about 1.875 million Kentuckians vaccinated, but there's some uh, better news in there. Uh, why don't we bring up uh, the, the demographic slide? We're, we're putting all this in, in one big chart now. Okay, so our best news is we are over 80% of Kentuckians 65 and up that are now uh, vaccinated. That is incredibly important given uh, how this virus uh, killed so many people in that age group. Uh, 50 to 64 at about 55%, still running ahead of the rest of the state, but not as high as we'd like it to be. Uh, for those that are eligible, uh, 16 and up, we've got about 53% of our state uh, that has had, uh, again, that's 53% of people 16 and up that have had at least uh, one uh, dose of one of the vaccines. Still more women than men, 55.3 uh, to 44.7. Um, we, we are making gradual uh, improvement as we look at equity um, with our Black and African American populations ticking up from last week at 5.8% of total uh, vaccines to 5.9%. Again, that's increasing every single week. Uh, the other is still really high. Uh, and so that, that we know that that distorts the numbers in some way, but hard to get that information. Uh, Hispanic population, uh, making up 2.8% uh, of, of total um, individuals vaccinated. I want to remind you of um, uh, the news uh, that as early as this week, Pfizer uh, could get authorization for COVID vaccines for 12 to 15-year-olds. Once we uh, know when that is going to occur, uh, we believe that we're going to be able to set a timeline for 100% capacity. Um, certainly in, um, in events, venues, businesses, et cetera, with under 1,000 people. Uh, what we want to do is give time for this age group to get vaccinated because they are um, uh, certainly out and about in uh, those types of activities, but this will be really exciting. Uh, we have a map today uh, on where you can find Pfizer. This is where it is as of the end of last week, and we are working to get it out uh, even further. Um, with that, I wanna go over to Dr. Stack, who's gonna talk about the best way. If uh, you're looking for your child's uh, vaccination site, given that it can only be Pfizer, if they are uh, 17 and under, on how to find it and our transition on our website uh, to the federal vaccine finder, which is finally caught up with and probably eclipsed our capabilities. I know he's got a couple other things he wants to cover, but here's Dr. Stack. Uh, thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about, uh, James, can you put up that map uh, real quick that the governor just showed for the um, Pfizer? So these are locations that we know now have Pfizer. So this is a combination of hospitals and uh, probably a lot of pharmacies. There will probably be more sites if Pfizer is approved, as we anticipate this week, there will be more locations 
that probably have Pfizer because now that there's a larger population eligible for it um, and only Pfizer will be approved for that age group, I suspect some additional sites will get access to Pfizer as we go forward. Um, we have doctor's offices have now uh, been eligible uh, just very recently to order vaccine. One of the challenges with the Pfizer is still the really large shipment sizes where it's 1,170 doses per shipment. Uh, that being said, we're working actively to try to uh, redeploy Pfizer throughout the state and find ways uh, to break it down into smaller quantities, hopefully to make it more available in more locations. So it continues to be a journey, uh, but we're really committed to trying to make this as available as possible. For Pfizer, uh, for parents out there, uh, they did additional studies specifically on uh, adolescents and tweens, and they have found uh, the Pfizer to be incredibly uh, safe and very well tolerated. The children can have a similar uh, response like uh, some of us might have with a little soreness uh, in your arm or your shoulder where you have the vaccination delivered. Uh, you could have uh, some aches or a little fatigue, but kids bounce back very quickly and it's been very well tolerated. Uh, additionally, um, uh, they have found that uh, it has been, at least in the initial studies, 100% protective from serious illness. Uh, so that's been uh, very good to see as well. Uh, hopefully down the road, maybe a month or so from now, hopefully Moderna will also get approved. But in the meantime, uh, Pfizer will hopefully come out this week uh, and be approved. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices will meet this Wednesday. Uh, and hopefully the FDA will have rendered its decision today or tomorrow. Uh, and when ACIP meets, they'll recommend um, what age groups uh, they think it's appropriate for, and everyone anticipates it will be the age 12 to 15 uh, after the FDA rules. Um, James, do you have the video clip that I hope we sent over to, to show how to get through vaccines.gov? Um, for, for Kentuckians, we are gonna transition the website as of today. And when you go to the website and click on vaccines, it'll say how to find a vaccine you click on a, a link that we've embedded there, it will take you to a federal site and you can put in your zip code. And when you put in the uh, zip code, it will um, show you all the sites that have vaccine near you. And you can pick, do you want Pfizer? Do you want Moderna? Do you want J&J? &J? You can pick a combination of those three. Uh, additionally, you can put, do you want within five miles or 10 miles or 15 or 25 miles? So you can set your range for how far you're willing to travel, and it will help you locate um, places that you can go get vaccine by specific type. Now, of course, you want to look for Pfizer, specifically if you're looking for ages 12 to 15. We're also working with local health departments uh, and also with Wild Health uh, to try to offer options uh, to schools uh, so that when this is approved, schools can work with vaccine providers and I spoke with uh, a pharmacy chain today uh, as well that will hopefully do some outreach to schools. So we'd like to make this as convenient as possible for everybody. Um, I thought we have a video, but I may not have it in James's possession. So we'll have to come back to that. Uh, the last thing I wanna share is James, can you put up my slide deck? We'll just use the first slide from the slides I sent over today. We, I mentioned this last week, but we are going to show um, online on our desktop dashboard. So if you go to kycovid19.ky.gov, right on the main page, you scroll down, you'll see the incidence rate map. To the right of that, there is desktop dashboard. If you click on that, there's a whole suite of dashboards you can look at. And one of the ones you can toggle to is now a county positivity rate dashboard. So these colors align with the CDC guidance on their website, and the ranges are shown in a pop-up menu over there. The gray areas, if you see the counties that are grayed out more, uh, just so happens on this one to be in the western part of the state, but that changes from day to day, where there are no numbers, that means they did not have at least 30 tests performed over the last seven-day period. And so we're not able to calculate a positivity rate. And for those of you who are taking pictures for social media or looking, uh, you'll notice, uh, I think it's Union County over there is gray and has a number. 
that this is a pre-production dashboard that is all corrected for the live version, which will go live between four and five o'clock this afternoon. So, so now um, through the miracle of automation, which has been a long way in coming, we went from 34 labs reporting electronically at the beginning of this journey last March up to over 600 now. We're able to automate a dashboard like this, which makes this much better. Uh, so um, I hope uh, for those of you who want to take a look at this, this will be helpful to you. I think the incidence rate is still the single best metric for you to use in general to see um, how, um, uh, how common the disease is in your area. Um, <laughs> they're trying to get the video up. So, so Governor, that's why I'm buying an extra minute here while they put this up. If we can get this video to come up, it'll show you what it looks like to navigate through the website uh, and how to access vaccine. One other thing on our website, if you look up there uh, today, um, it's not gonna work, I'm told. So one of the things um, uh, you can do is you can also text, and the phone numbers are on the website, you can text to either GetVax or you can text to Vacuna, uh, V-A-C-U-N-A, which is Spanish. Uh, if you want it in Spanish and you text your zip code, it'll send you right back really within seconds, three different uh, vaccine sites near you. So uh, sorry about the video. If we get it up later, maybe they'll let the governor know and he can show it. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I encourage you all to please get vaccinated as quick as you can. Um, governor's already said we're going to uh, lift more restrictions. And uh, the safest way for us to do that is for everyone to be protected through the vaccine. So thank you, Governor. Back to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, vaccination openings. Uh, there are a lot. No matter where you are in the Commonwealth, if you want to get vaccinated tomorrow, you can do so within a very short drive. Certainly some of the largest openings, which we'll put up, uh, UofL Health Cardinal Stadium, Pikeville, Owensboro, uh, Ephraim McDowell, uh, and, and uh, Muhlenberg County as well, uh, Owen, Owensboro's health uh, facility there. Folks, we need people to keep getting vaccinated. It's proven to be incredibly safe. The vaccines have been incredibly effective. Uh, we're gonna be showing here um, in the future, percentage of cases we think that we can calculate. Um, I think since February 1st, over 99% uh, of all of the positives we've had have been in unvaccinated individuals. We're going to break that down. We're also we're in to, so that we can show you uh, how most of the cases that we're seeing, these are just individuals that have thus far either not been able to or chosen not to get vaccinated. And unfortunately they're, they're getting COVID, but it shows you how effective the vaccine is at preventing that from happening. Uh, I think this is our chance to be patriotic Americans, to protect those around us and to win this war. So please get vaccinated. And the Kentucky Lottery has announced a new program that allows free lottery plays to Kroger and Walmart customers getting the COVID-19 vaccination. Not only will this encourage Kentuckians to get the life-saving COVID-19 vaccine, it gives them a, a chance. You know, you get your shot of hope and then a shot at winning $225,000. The promotion's available for anyone over the age of 18 who gets a first or second COVID-19 vaccination at the 170 participating Kroger or Walmart locations. The offer is good through next Friday. So if you, if you want to take advantage, get out there and get it or until the 225,000 tickets that are available run out. It'd be great if we had 225,000 more Kentuckians vaccinated in those next couple of weeks. It's just an effort to get us closer uh, to getting enough people vaccinated uh, to get out of this. All right, um, we announced uh, last week that on May 28th, we'd be going to 75% for uh, anything under 1,000 people, 60% for over. Also want to announce on May 28th, we are ending the, the curfew uh, for bars and restaurants and bar seating will be allowed again. We're also going to be updating for next week our healthy at work um, uh, guidance um, and requirements. And that'll provide some flexibility starting on May 28th on social distancing. Um, but I want everybody to remember uh, that that. We have been and we're going to continue to be uh, loosening these restrictions, um, but but be reasonable. Uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, look at your own facilities. Look at the ability for air to move in and out. Um, look at what your uh, vaccination rates are in your county and what your incident rates are 
and try to make good decisions. I know everybody wants to protect their clientele, those that they serve. And now you can you can look at positivity rates, you can look at incident rates, you can look at all of it. Uh, there's lots of guidance online to try to make those very best decisions. All right, today's um, COVID report, 167 new positive cases. That's less than the last several weeks. Uh, 11 new deaths, including nine uh, that come through the local health department. Most of them are older and two through our audit. These deaths include an 83-year-old woman from Ballard County. It's from December. A 68-year-old man from Fayette. That's November. A 92-year-old woman from Floyd. That happened in April. A 79-year-old woman from Gallatin, December. An 85-year-old man from Gallatin, December. A 53-year-old woman from Grayson, September. A 63-year-old man from Owsley, March of this year. An 86-year-old man from Pendleton, November and a 79-year-old woman from Russell, uh, December. The audit deaths were an 89-year-old woman from Fayette, December, and an 84-year-old woman from Muhlenberg, uh, December. Positivity rate, 3.25%. Um, and, and once again, a higher incident rate amongst people 59 years and younger than 50 and older. That's directly attributable to the fact that 50 and older has a much higher vaccination rate than those that are younger. Uh, Long-term care, a little bit better than some days, but we still don't like to see um, uh, any new people getting it. Just one new resident, seven additional staff, uh, two additional deaths attributable to the long-term care context. All right, with that, we will open it up to uh, our, our fearless reporters. We'll start with Chad Hedrick from WKYT. Hi, Governor. Uh, so four weeks ago today was when you first announced the vaccination goal, and you said then it would take four to six weeks to reach that two and a half million. So I'm just curious to see how you think this is how it's going so far, if you think we'll be able to accomplish this in that uh, in that window of time. Well, it's it's taken us longer to get to two point five million people vaccinated than I hope anybody um, would have wanted to see. The more people who are vaccinated, the safer we are. Uh, since the vaccines not only virtually eliminate death and serious illness, but it appears that that it keeps you from getting the virus or spreading the virus, uh, at least at the same rate of somebody being unvaccinated. The more people we get vaccinated, um, the faster we defeat this once and for all, and the more lives that, that we save. Um, with that said, uh, our cases are remaining low. Uh, they are projected to go lower, um, certainly as we move uh, through the, the summer, and, and that's all good news. It's also going to be really good news uh, when 12 to 15-year-olds to can get vaccinated. That opens up a, a whole new group where we are pretty close to uh, most all Americans at least having the choice to protect themselves and, and those around us. Uh, do I want to see more people get vaccinated? Heck yes, I do. Am I open to any and all ideas? Uh, yes. I think it's really unfortunate that there's so much misinformation out there that uh, some people aren't making a decision I think they otherwise would. Yes, that's, that's, that's really uh, unfortunate. Karen Zarr from WKY. Good afternoon, thank you. Governor, how will the state be tracking the health conditions of the COVID long haulers? And will there be any funding available for those patients who are uninsured? Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, let's go over to Dr. Stack if we still have him. No, we don't have him on the line. Uh, Karen, I know that we have reporting measures. He's back. Okay. Let's go over to Dr. Stack. I'm here. I just turned my camera off briefly. I'm here. Uh, so thank you, Karen, for the question. Thank you, Governor. Uh, tracking long haulers is going to be difficult. It just is because their symptoms are... Um, a variety of things, fatigue, brain fog, difficulty with breathing. It doesn't, there's a, a syndrome that'll be described over time, I'm sure, but it's very, very difficult. And not everybody says, oh, I have these problems. Uh, they only become aware later that it's a, a prolonged uh, part of COVID. We do think though that 10% or more of all people can have the long hauler syndrome. COVID's a bad disease, folks. It, it's, a, it's not something you wanna take your chances with if you can get a vaccine instead. We know that people have serious problems. 
um, that linger and that uh, people get sick for weeks or months at times and take a very, particularly if you go in an ICU, your recovery can be very long, months or longer. So, uh, but Karen, I don't think there's a ready way to track it because it's still a large, ill-defined population and with more time, hopefully will become more clear, um, but it's not as trackable easily as some of the other metrics. Uh, Governor? All right, my day would not be complete without Tom Latek. Tom, you're up. Gosh, thanks, Governor. Uh, you're gonna make me blush here. Um, I have questions about uh, Sunrise Children's Hospital. Uh, since the state came to them in 1970s to uh, help out with uh, um, children, and they have 600 over that right now, every year they've gotten a contract to uh, continue providing their services for uh, children. Uh, this year, there's been no contract. And when they call uh, the cabinet, there's a, I'm told there's at least 20 phone calls that haven't been returned uh, by the cabinet uh, talking about the contract. What is the uh, sticking situation and what happens to the 600 kids if there is no agreement? Well, Sunrise has provided uh, services to kids in Kentucky for a long time, and we appreciate uh, those services. My understanding on this is that a contract was offered. Uh, it has the type of non-discrimination clause that is required, or the cabinet says is required by federal law. Um, I think that that's enforced by a settlement agreement from a uh, long-term uh, lawsuit uh, that the cabinet was faced by uh, folks that thought that certain contracts uh, allowed for uh, the potential for uh, discrimination, as well as I believe there's a, a, a Supreme Court case that's been uh, fairly recent and strong on that point too. So my understanding is that Sunrise has been offered a contract, but unless a, a portion of a standard non-discrimination clause is crossed through, which is my understanding of what they're asking for, that they won't sign the contract. But, but the same contract, I believe, is there for them that's available for uh, other facilities uh, out there. So um, again, I, I hope that they'll continue uh, dialogue. I have no idea about who's returning whose phone calls. I try not to get in arguments uh, like that. I think I tried to learn that in my teen and, and college years. Um, but I, 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 get, I hope that, that, that something can be worked out um, and that it ensures that uh, everybody's rights are ultimately protected. Catherine Collins from WLEX. Thank you, Governor. You talked about the timeline or setting a timeline for lifting capacity limits based on the availability of the vaccine to those younger ages. Um, is there a timeline in your mind as far as lifting the mask mandate for indoor settings, or are you still sticking to that 2.5 million vaccine point? Uh, Catherine, we're going to wait on what appears to be uh, got new guidance that we will receive from the from the CDC. And one of the reasons that we were able to, to loosen up a little faster than the 2.5 million is that the CDC has been providing new and additional guidance. I think Dr. Fauci said that he expected we would see that uh, sometime soon. So that's something we're gonna take into consideration. I certainly think that it's going to happen uh, this summer, uh, fully expect it too. Uh, but again, we've, we've, we've never made these decisions based on pressure or, or knee jerk reactions even with summer starting, and, and that's one of those, um, I guess, dates that's imprinted on, on all of us, because we saw restlessness last summer too. We've always um, uh, done things based on, on the science, and we're waiting to hear uh, more about where the CDC says that science is uh, when, when they give their next update, which we expect to be soon. Uh, Kelly Dean from WBKO. Hello, Governor. Um, our Med Center Health Vaccine Clinic is strongly considering opening to just one day a week due to decrease in the demand of the vaccine. I know our regional Kroger site closed Saturday as well. Was that for decrease in demand? And kind of ping-ponging off the last question, I know that you've announced some dates for restrictions being slightly lifted. Uh, would you consider a fully reopening date? Uh, not necessarily the mask. I understand there's some research still needs to go into that, but just fully reopening the state. 
Well, thank you for, for the question. The mass Kroger sites have been and are being uh, transitioned uh, with all of that vaccine going out to stores, regular stores all across Kentucky. It's because we weren't seeing enough demand at them. And so our goal now is to have vaccine everywhere you go to the grocery or the drugstore or anywhere else that, that you would spend regular parts of your week and making it as convenient as possible. And then if we can, providing incentives. Uh, on the question of, and everybody calls it reopening, let's start with the basic fact that our economy is open. Yes, there are a few capacity restrictions. It is not getting in the way of people's spending. In April, we had the highest uh, sales tax, which is a direct measure of how much is going on in our economy of any April in our entire history, not just comparing um, to times in the pandemic in our uh, history. We see more jobs announcements. We see more economic development interest than ever before. We see one of our first upgrades in our economic outlook that I can uh, remember. Uh, we see uh, such positive news that's out there. By May 28th, we're going to be at 75% capacity and everything under 1,000. Now, do I think that necessarily everything will fill up that amount? Uh, it'll all depend on how comfortable people are. Remember, if we don't just ease back into it, it may take longer for things to fill up to that amount because of whether people feel safe or not. And really, to have 75% in a small space you want as many of those people as vaccinated as possible. And now people have a runway to say, well, end of the month, if I want to do these things, I ought to get vaccinated. Uh, to hit 100% capacity, we're going to wait and, and, and see this news on the 12 to 15-year-olds. And if they are approved, um, which we think that they will, uh, then we'll be able to set from that time point uh, a, a schedule uh, to reach 100% capacity because then the vast majority of Kentuckians will have had at least the option uh, to get their vaccine at that point and to be protected. Let's remember that up until now, our kids haven't had the choice or the opportunity uh, if they are under 16 years old. So this gives them the chance. Debbie Yetter from the Courier Journal. Hi, Governor. Um, regarding the Sunrise contract, does the clause that the uh, Baptist uh, agency objects to involve sexual orientation, and are they um, correct in their claim that it has been waived in the past? My understanding is that is the clause. Uh, my understanding is that uh, there's recently been a settlement agreement that impacts this from litigation against the state. Um, uh, possibly because of those waivers. Uh, my understanding is that there is a new uh, Supreme Court case uh, since the last time a contract uh, came along. And at least the cabinet is telling me that inclusion of uh, what's previously been struck is required by federal law. Now, if the lawyers on both sides wanna get together and talk about that, if the parties can keep talking, then, then good. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, when I'm told that something has to be included uh, because of federal law, you know, that, that's, that's something you don't get much of a choice in. Corinne Boyer from WEKU. No, no. Can we pull up Corinne? And then we'll, we'll do. Okay. Corinne Boyer from WEKU. I'll apologize to Melissa Patrick in a minute. Oh, sorry. Hi, Governor. Um, my question is about the news of the Kentucky Derby winner, Medina Spirit, failing that post-race blood test. Do you think this is a black eye on the horse racing industry in Kentucky? And do you have plans to open a special committee to look into this? Well, certainly the news out about Medina Spirit uh, is, is, is not helpful for a signature industry for Kentucky. Um, if uh, it it holds, it's it's disappointing. Certainly, there is a, a due process procedure where uh, the the trainer, um, the owners can and should uh, be able to ask for the split sample uh, if they need do a, a, a DNA test, present uh, whatever it is that they want to present. They need that opportunity. But if this holds, it is very disappointing. We expect people to uh, run these races without cheating. Uh, again, there's an opportunity uh, here to be heard, to go through the due process and to see if that 
was the, the, the case. Uh, there's lots of committees out there. There's certainly the, the group that's been created on the uh, national stage that I know will be looking at this. One of the things that they're aimed at doing is trying to make sure every racetrack has the, the same rules, uh, especially on these, these drug tests. But uh, the rule here was well known to anybody running in the Kentucky Derby. So I'm, I'm disappointed at the news. And if it holds, I'll be I'll be very disappointed um, that 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 not only that that this happened, but um, very disappointed that anybody um, uh, would cheat if if that happened. But I want to make sure I say that they are going to get due process. They are going to have their opportunity to to prove that there was a mistake, and they should get that opportunity. Now, this is just the way the rules are set up. There's nothing silly going on here. There's no cancel culture or anything else. Um, this is basic rules, drug test, failed drug test, process after the drug test where you can dispute it. There's nothing political about it. These are the way the rules work and the process that, that has to be followed. All right, Melissa Patrick, I'm sorry I skipped you, but you now get our very last question. Um, not a problem. Thank you, Governor. Um, I'm curious about the, the CDC's updated language on the uh, aerosolization of the coronavirus and what that will mean for Kentucky schools and businesses. And, and what uh, would you or Dr. Stack say to the argument that um, with that sort of declared at this point by the CDC, uh, nowhere, no one is safe in a poorly ventilated building? Well, we should go over to Dr. Stack for that. I think we've we've believed um, this for a while that it is uh, being spread uh, through the air. Uh, I certainly think it it's another reason why masks have been uh, so important. Uh, also, why there is a responsibility for any business owner, school, et cetera, that's poorly ventilated to really look at what is possible and what is safe. Let's take it over to Dr. Stack if you want to. Give your response, and then uh, Dr. Stack, why don't you close us out tonight? All right, thank you, Melissa. So I think the governor, the governor does a pretty good job as uh, given the public health guidance at this stage of the journey. So um, we have suspected for a while that this uh, disease could be transmitted by aerosols, and ventilation has been important all along. And that's one of the single biggest distinctions between indoor versus outdoor spaces is just the sheer volume of air exchange that happens outdoors versus the decreased air exchange that happens in a confined space. So it's very important uh, until people are all vaccinated that we continue to exercise caution, particularly in interior spaces and around people who are vulnerable or not vaccinated. So as we look forward um, to the, the final uh, couple months, hopefully, of this journey for us here, um, I have to continue to encourage people, one, please get vaccinated. It's, it's one of the single most powerful things we can do to minimize the spread of disease. Two, do activities outdoors to the fullest extent possible rather than indoors. Three, if you are indoors, please increase the ventilation as much as possible. Open windows. Uh, if you are in an environment where you have options for um, air filtration, uh, better filtration systems in industrial air handlers, uh, please look at your options for that. I think that's all very important. But I think uh, the CDC's uh, updated guidance is consistent with the journey we've been on for quite a while now. Uh, and I think that the guidelines that we have recommended uh, adequately cover those uh, if people uh, adhere to those. Uh, folks, we are almost finished with this journey, uh, I hope. And remember, COVID is a bad disease. It does bad things to people and has caused a lot of harm, not only death, but, but disability and uh, COVID long hauler problems, which were identified by one of the earlier reporters uh, asking questions tonight. Uh, COVID is not good. Uh, vaccinations are a way to help us get out of this and get back fully to life um, like the way we used to know it. The rest of the world is still facing an incredible challenge with COVID and we all sink or swim together. We've got to make sure we get everybody vaccinated because we're not out of this until all of us are out of it or else the uh, mutations and the variations of the virus can cause harm, which undermine the success of the vaccine. So please um, exercise diligence, exercise care.
but we are soon upon us uh, in the place where people will have to now exercise their choice what settings to go into and what risk to take on. Uh, the vaccines give you the chance, coupled with your personal choices, to minimize your own risk um, and take steps now to protect yourselves. And this is a place I think we've all wanted to get to for a long time. So thank you for uh, all your help over this past 14 plus months of this pandemic. And, and let's sure hope that this summer, and certainly by the time we reach the 4th of July, that we are much more to a state of normalcy in the world that we have long missed. Uh, it remains a privilege to serve for you uh, and with you. And thank you very much uh, for uh, all you've done to help get us where we are. I hope you have a good evening. And until next time, please take care and stay safe. Uh, good night.